Christy Shriver. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit Podcast. Today, we wrap up our discussion of what Aristotle calls the greatest of all plays. Of course, although I wouldn't have said this in a few years ago, I think this may be truer now even than Aristotle knew. It's amazing to think that a play so old and outdated in a stylistic sense could even be taken seriously today uh, because there's no humor, there's no blood, except right at the very end, or gore. Uh, All the good stuff happens off stage. There's no sex, no special effects, nor even any profanity. All the things that modern movie producers feel they must include to get anyone to watch their films. In fact, even the language is stiff by today's standards. There's no nuance in the characterization. The the characters are flat. The setting is basic. It's a musical, and those are hard to pull off even nowadays. So, what makes this play great? What makes it so popular? And what makes people still read it year after year? That's the question we're going to try to answer as we pick up where we left off after the third choral ode and take it to its very tragic conclusion. Well, actually, Aristotle answers that question. In fact, he referenced this play 10 times in his great essay, Poetics, and he really, truly loved it. The short answer is that he believed that Oedipus elicits the greatest amount of catharsis, which we talked about last week. We talked about that that's what emotional release is. It's kind of like what's supposed to happen in psychotherapy. Aristotle details exactly what emotions he's talking about, though. When you're talking about tragedy, if you remember, he's talking about pity and fear. And by pity, he doesn't mean like, oh, you poor little straight kitten in the road. I'm so sorry for you. That's not the word that he means. When he says pity, he's talking about pathos, empathy, sympathy. We will, by the end of this play, feel for Oedipus. We will feel his pain. And that's what the play is supposed to do and effectively does. Now, I've thought about that all week uh, as we've been thinking about this podcast. And I thought, well, how does it elicit emotion because no one cries when they see this play it's too stiff people are yelling in some sense but there is this mysterious sense that i really believe that he's right and i'm going to try to make that argument and you'll have to tell me if you think it's persuasive before uh, we end our discussion so getting to aristotle and catharsis what makes people different from animals one thing at least according to aristotle is that people have the ability to see the world from another person's point of view. And Aristotle's going to say that that's really what art is all about. We're looking through the lenses of someone else's eyes at their world. And when that's sad, that's what tragedy is about. So feeling for Oedipus is because we can, by the end of this play, see the world the way He sees it. And that's where we should have our minds as we read the end of the play. The things that Oedipus has done is truly what I suggest would be the worst thing that any good person could ever do. Uh, So before we watch Oedipus learn the truth about himself uh, and think about what the Greeks, because this isn't Sophocles' story. This is a much older story than Sophocles. But what the Greeks did when they created this character, what they were trying to do uh, is this. So they create this guy, a nice guy, a noble guy. And from his very birth, he had some really bad setbacks that were not his fault. And I would say it's a bad setback if your parents try to kill you when you're born. That's bad. Uh, He's saved from that. Uh, And obviously he has a good soul because he's loved by his new parents and they're glad that they adopted him. He's not a perfect guy. He has issues. He has a temper. A lot of us have that. He's a bit impulsive. A lot of us are like that. He unwittingly gets in an altercation and kills a dude, presumably in his mind out of self-defense, but that gets overshadowed because right after that he gets to save an entire town This is a man who loves his wife, he loves his children, he loves his community. And in this sense, we are Oedipus. 
Lots of us have had setbacks as children. Maybe we weren't foundlings and our parents didn't try to kill us, but we have had stuff in our childhood that we feel like left us at a disadvantage compared to over uh, other people. And hopefully, no matter how far in life uh, you've come, you feel like you've been able to overcome some of the deficits that could have faded you kind of to destruction early on. So in that sense, we're like Oedipus, most of us anyway, In another sense, we're like Oedipus in that we know that we have our personality issues. Um, Everyone, if they're honest, has to struggle with pride issues in some way. Uh, You have to struggle with something. But hopefully, if you're a good person, over time, you're trying to get better and better. And as you do, hopefully, things get better for you. Maybe you haven't saved a town, but hopefully you've had an opportunity to better other people's lives in some ways. So in this sense, Oedipus is the extreme version of all of us. Now, have this in your mind. What if you found out that this had happened to you? This most disgusting and horrible thing that you could possibly imagine. So Gary, bring us up to speed. What? So all of this that I'm talking about happened before the play started. But since the play started, what happened until we get to this third choral ode? Sure. Uh, Well, the play opened up with the people of Thebes coming to Oedipus and appealing to his greatness. Their city is suffering from a horrible plague and they need a hero. And he is a hero. He saved them before from the Sphinx in their greatest time of need, and they're all at that level of suffering again. Well, he sent his brother-in-law off to Delphi to see the oracle, and the oracle has told him that the city is plagued with a person who has brought on a curse because he's killed Laius, the former king of Thebes. Oedipus hears this and vows he's going to save the city no matter what, and he calls out, all kinds of curses on the person who has brought this plague on the city. Just as soon as he says such a thing, an old blind prophet shows up. They have an argument. Oedipus makes him mad, and Tiresias says, Fine, I wasn't going to tell you, but you've made me mad. You're the one that killed Laius. Oh, and the one who killed Laius married his mom, and his kids are his brothers and his sisters. Now go figure it out. Obviously, this news isn't well received. Oedipus loses his temper and attacks his brother-in-law, saying he's trying to take over the country. All of this escalates until his wife, Jocasta, shows up. Oedipus tells her that Creon has accused him of murder by means of a prophet. Jocasta, in an effort to try to comfort Oedipus, tells him not to believe in prophets because they don't know anything. She tells about a prophecy she received years ago that didn't come true. The prophecy said that her other husband, Laius, would be killed by his son. And that didn't come true because he was killed by robbers at the junction in the road between Thebes, Delphi, and Corinth. Oedipus, for the first time in their marriage, asks her what the other husband looked like. And if there were any witnesses to the crime, apparently there was one witness who ran away when Oedipus showed up in the town. Oedipus decides to track down this guy. He also tells Jocasta a story of his own, a story about killing a guy right before he came into Thebes. The timing is not good, and Oedipus seems to get just a little freaked out that this story may indeed have a chance of being true. So we're interrupted again by another choral ode. This choral ode is going to discuss the idea of whether or not we should believe prophecies And then we're on to the third episode. So, Christy, what are we looking at now? Ha, looking at, that's a complicated and ironic word. (laughs) Because looking and seeing is at the heart of what we're supposed to be. Looking and seeing, it's a pun. Ironic. (laughs) All right, all of a sudden, the theater goer is getting ready to see unfold what Aristotle calls recognition and then reversal. Should that come with music like dun dun dun? <laughs> it should. And one thing that Aristotle brings out about this play that he really admired is that this all is going to come on really fast. Recognition, discovery, revelation, whatever you want to call it, is the idea that you're going to have some fact that's going to come out 
And the protagonist is going to be able to see something clearly that he hasn't been able to see before. And I want to point out that this play, clearly the protagonist is Oedipus. There's no other competing figure. You can't look at it from a different perspective. And it is this revelation that is going to lead to his downfall. And this is where it gets psychologically interesting. It's almost like the Greeks try to come up with the most awful thing they can make up and then imagine what could happen to that person after that. I can't know that there would be anything worse. Well, couldn't you argue that mass murder is worse? That a horrible disease that kills you slowly is worse? Couldn't there be any number of things that are worse than Oedipus' predicament? I don't think so. And let me tell you why. Oedipus, like I already said, is a good guy. We are supposed to identify with Oedipus. So stick with me. Not that any of us want to kill our dad and marry our mom. He really didn't want to do that either. If you consider yourself a good person, you probably think like this. I take care of my family. I love my kids. I help my neighbors. I try to do the right thing. I serve in my community. Maybe I coach Little League. Maybe you serve in your church. Maybe you do something for your school. I don't know. Uh, Oedipus is all of those things, and he's better at it than all of us. He freaking saved a city from the Sphinx. Not very many people can say that. He's been a good king for a long time. He's raised four children into adulthood successfully, and everyone loves him. And yet, dot, 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 he killed a guy. True, but the Greeks don't really judge him for that. Not in this play. He viewed it at the time as an act of self-defense. And although he does have that rashness problem, and he probably shouldn't have done it in retrospect, clearly in light of the Oracle, the Greeks don't really come down hard on him for the murder thing. Oh, and just one more thing. He just got the first hint that he might actually be a grotesque human being. And look what he does. He looks for the truth. He runs to the truth. He's interested in truth. That's a noble thing in any culture. So when you read the play for the first time, at least I'm going to speak for myself, when I read the first time, I really thought that the big problem with Oedipus, because I knew this was a thing with Greek plays, that, oh, he's too proud. Oedipus is too proud, and the gods got it in for him. But really, his sin, if you want to use that word, and the Greeks do, the where he missed the mark isn't in being too proud, although that didn't help him. What is at the heart of this play, the ultimate sin is not knowing who you are as a person. It's in seeing. It's in not seeing. And I guess that brings us back to the Oracle of Apollo. One thing we could have said last week, but we saved it for today, If you go to Delphi, besides just the ruins, there is an archaeological museum there. And inside the museum are a lot of things that have been found and preserved from this incredibly historic site. One of the things that has miraculously survived all the wars and whatnot over the years are two stone inscriptions that were located at the entrance of Apollos Temple. The first statement is, nothing too much, which is worth thinking about, but perhaps the more famous is an idea that seems to connect to this play, and that's the famous phrase, know thyself. That's it, exactly. Where Oedipus missed the mark, what he did wrong that led to everything else is the challenge that Apollo issued to him. And remember, I said at the beginning, the gods don't create your fate, but the fate is kind of a challenge to you. The oracles are challenges, and this is where he failed. He didn't know who he was, not really. And when he uncovers it, it's ugly and he doesn't like what he sees. So let's go through the revelation. Okay, well, the first thing that happens is the messenger comes from Corinth and claims to bring good news. Yes, and now we're back to dramatic irony. He thinks it's good news, but we know it's bad news. He's congratulating Oedipus because his dad has died and he's inherited Corinth. Jocasta is elated because now he can't kill his father. But Oedipus brings up the idea that, yeah, but I could still marry my mom. (laughs) (laughs) Which seems strange to say, 
But what is even more strange is this kind of uber famous line that Sigmund Freud is going to lift and basically use as the basis for his entire theory that we're going to explain at the end of the episode, which is really crazy misunderstood these days because it's not meant to be taken so literally. But here's the line, and it comes out of the mouth of Jocasta. She says, and I quote, Don't be afraid to marry your mother. Many a man before you in dreams has shared his mother's bed. But to live at ease, one must attach no importance to such things. And they just kind of go from there. Don't just even talk about it. <laughs> glide right past. <laughs> well, there you go. The Oedipus Complex line. I do look forward to hearing you explain that one. Uh, but back to this. And this is where the Corinthian messenger again has this moment of irony because he's going to say, Oedipus, you're not the birth child of Polypus and Merope, you're a foundling. He says this, I gave you to him. He had been childless and that's why he loved you. He goes on to say, I found you on Mount Scytheron. And he's going to say, I was your savior. Again, more irony because he's not saving him now. He's going to say, you had ankles pinned together and I freed you. That's where you get your name, Oedipus, which of course means swollen foot. Then he goes one step further, and then this gets worse. I got you from a shepherd who worked for Laius. Well, we're getting close now, and you would think at this point that the jig would be up, that he would have figured it out. What well, is for Jocasta, she knows, but notice that Oedipus is still blind. He can't see who he is, but she starts to backpedal and fast. And we begin to see her say things like, stop talking, stop digging, you don't need to know anything in this, don't, you're done, trust me, let's go. Uh, true, and that's why she is not the hero. And it's kind of why we don't really feel pity and fear for her. Uh, not nearly what we're going to feel for Oedipus. Oedipus is rash. He has a temper, but both of those things are bad. But look at what is good. He truly wants to do the right thing. He wants to know. He wants to get to the bottom no matter what it costs him. I mean, there's nobility in that. There's a lot of us that would stop. We'd say... Uh, I'm okay. I'm dropping out or at least wonder what we would do. I'd like to think that uh, I would do the right thing, but would I be strong enough? Joe Casta sees it coming and does not want to pursue this. She's actually dogmatic saying, I beg you do not go on with this. But it's not in his nature. Oedipus cannot help himself. It's him to press ahead no matter what. I wouldn't call it rashness at this point, but maybe this is a good place for us to drop in the Greek word, what the Greeks call hubris, because I'm maybe that's what it is. Hubris, according to the Greeks, is excessive pride or overconfidence. And the Greek gods don't like hubris because, in a sense, it's be, that's where men don't respect their place in the universe. And they're pushing the challenges. They're trying to say, fate, you don't get to tell me who I am and who I get to be. And, of course, the Greek gods don't like that. And this is exactly what Oedipus did in the beginning. When he said he was going to do this, he's going to say, no, I'm not doing that. And he ran from his fate. He runs from the prophecy. His arrogance, again, in another sense, is probably what led him not to investigate his past or not to investigate the past of Jocasta. And maybe it was his rashness and arrogance that led him to kill Laius. We don't know what they got in a fight for, but I'm guessing it was ego. I've never seen a fight that wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, arrogance or confidence, all, all we know is onward it goes. And he says things like this, nothing will move me. I will find out the whole truth. And it's also his hubris that is going to totally trash the, quote, good advice that she's trying to say. Uh, and he says this to her, good, this good advice of yours is trying my patience. That's mean. It's a horrible thing to say to your wife. <laughs> yeah, I've never used that line on you. Thank you. And anyway, I'm not sure it's worse than the last thing he said to her, which is ironic, too. He says... One of you go and get that shepherd and bring him here. We will leave her to pride herself on her royal birth. And he calls her proud and prideful a bunch of times here at the end. And again, totally ironic because yes. he's the pr proud one. And of course, she's going to answer back and say, unfortunate. That is the only name I can call you by now. I shall not call your name again ever. And that's true. She leaves to kill herself. The shepherd comes in and we have the full revelation. 
And almost immediately what Aristotle calls peripatia or reversal happens. And that means he goes from a high, high place to a low, low, low place. Oedipus is going to experience a total collapse of his world unlike anything any of us could ever imagine. They're going to figure out together who he is, who Jocasta is, who his father is. And then Oedipus utters these words, Oh God, it has all come to light, light. Let this be the last time I see you. I stand revealed, born in shame, married in shame, an unnatural murderer. And we as the audience, we feel sad. He didn't mean any of this. This wasn't who he chose to be. He leaves the stage for one more choral ode. It's the last one. And I kind of want to read a part of it because I think it's kind of worth hearing out. Uh, it says this, And now is there a man whose story is more pitiful? His life is lived in merciless calamity and pain, a complete reversal from his happy state. O Oedipus, famous king, you whom the great harbor sheltered as child and father both, how could the furrows which your father plowed bear you in silence for so long? Time which sees all things has found you out. It sits in judgment on the unnatural marriage, which was both begretter and begot. O son of Laius, I wish I had never seen you. I weep like a man wailing for the dead. This is the truth. You returned me to life once, and now you have closed my eyes in darkness. Oh. Not encouraging. No. He falls, not because he did something so bad in the sense that karma intervened. I did something bad. I got paid back bad. That's not it. But even in this, there is going to be this great irony. Thebes is being devastated. That's why they showed up in the beginning to begin with. That's why he went and sent for the oracle to begin with. They were in trouble and he sought to save them. And his last act as king, he will save them, but it's because it destroys him. And uh, that's the irony. At this point, a messenger is going to walk in and tell the audience that Jocasta has killed herself. So in a sense, Oedipus killed both his father and his mother, but not just that. He's destroyed the lives of his children. No one is going to want to marry his daughters now. They're gross to the world. And then as one final act of rashness, because Oedipus is still Oedipus, he stabs his eyes out. <laughs> and that is worth thinking about. Uh, really, it is because, in a sense, it's a noble thing to do, even though if he'd waited a couple of days, maybe he wouldn't have done it. I do want to mention that the Greeks looked at suicide differently than the Romans. We saw in Julius Caesar that the Romans kind of saw suicide as honorable if things got out of hand, like in Brutus's case. But the Greeks, although were more sympathetic than we are today, they did not actually see it necessarily as an act of nobility. If you look at the myths, women commit suicide way more than men, and it's kind of a confession that you can't handle what has been given to you. You can't handle your shame, and that is not Oedipus. Oedipus is actually strong. Well, that's true, and that that's why he's a hero. To use you know the Jack Nicholson line, he can handle the truth. <laughs> your male voices are so good. <laughs> Uh, but he doesn't want to have to look at the truth. He doesn't want to have to look at his children. He doesn't want to have to look at light. That's what he said. The last thing that his eyes will ever see is his dead wife. And in a bloody scene that the audiences do not see, he spears, they say he spears out his pupils. It says this. He ripped out the golden pins with which her clothes were fastened, raised them high above his head, and speared the pupils of his eyes. You will not see, he said, the horrors I have suffered and done, but dark forever, eyes that saw those you should never have seen and failed to recognize those you longed to see. 
Murmuring words like these, he raised his hands and struck his eyes again and again. And each time the wounded eyes sent a stream of blood down his chin. No oozing flow, but a dark shower of it, thick as a hailstorm. That's blood everywhere. Almost like this internal purge is coming mm-hmm. out, the darkness of his soul. And, of course, the ultimate irony at the moment that he sees who he really is he doesn't want to see anything else in the world and he's mad and he's not mad at other people he's not mad at the gods he's mad at himself because he didn't see i would like to point out here that one thing that's amazing about greek culture during this time period is their emphasis on reflecting as is demonstrated very clearly in this play uh, that's a sign of an advanced culture when the individuals are thinking about what's my purpose, who am I, uh, what do my actions mean? Those are deep things. So, and um, how they can have personal agency in the world. Yes, yes, and think and remember, this is four hundred century, four hundred AD. So, BC. Oh, BC. My bad. Yeah. Let's back it up eight hundred years. <laughs> this story is extremely ancient, even before yes. Sophocles wrote it. Yeah. All really interesting, and honestly, uh, it's something that everyone who's ever had to take a hard look at themselves inside has been through this kind of situation. If there was any internal problem they've ever had to deal with. And, and even things like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder are, are expressions of this. So uh, when you look inside and see what is inside every single one of us, um, sometimes we experience a bloodletting. And yet, I want to point out that this bloodletting is not the end of the play. We still have almost 200 more lines. Because after looking at the darkness of his own soul and deciding to live in physical darkness for the rest of his life, we can see that Oedipus is still a good person. He doesn't say oh, I hate my life, I hate you. He doesn't curse the gods. He doesn't blame Jocasta. He thinks about his children. Creon walks in, and in a spirit of selfless selflessness, he's going to reflect about that. The town that he lives in, he says, I need you to banish me out of this place. And, of course, he's going to do that. And then he's going to turn his thoughts to his children. He's going to say, Let my destiny go where it will. But as for my children, do not concern yourself about the boys, Creon. They are men, and they will always find a way to live wherever they may be. But my two poor, helpless girls who were always at my table, who shared the same food I ate, take care of them for me. What I wish for most is this. Let me touch them with these hands as I weep for my sorrows. Please, my Lord, grant my prayer, generous generous man. If I could hold them, I would think I had them with me, as I did when I could see. Oh, it's so sad. And what is the name of one of those daughters? Antigone. She's the good one. The good one <laughs> that we're going we're gonna to take up discussing next time. That's right. But Oedipus is a hero, and this whole thing is emotionally cathartic. And if you can't feel that, you have no feelings. That's true. The final words of the play... Scholars tell us we're not actually in the original script. They were kind of added later, not that that matters, because they do kind of sum up uh, the challenge, I guess, that the Greeks wanted you to take away. And and they say this, um, On his good fortune, all the citizens gazed with envy, talking about into the, the beginning of his life, into what a stormy sea of dreadful trouble he has come now. Therefore, we must call no man happy while he waits to see his last day, not until he has passed the border of life and death without suffering pain, which, of course, no one can do. (laughs) Indeed. So before we wind this up, let's talk about the 20th century application of Oedipus Rex, as given to us by Sigmund Freud. And when I say 20th century, uh, Freud's going to begin publishing some of his important works right at 1900. So we're going to just get one foot into that 20th century there. Uh, Freud's, one of his most famous ideas is the Oedipus complex. That's really why 
people who heard of the play, I think more people know it from Freud than they do maybe from Sophocles. Right. And so I think it is probably important to pull this out and maybe straighten out a little bit of the Oedipus complex because, wow, there is a uh, few people more misunderstood than Freud in a lot of ways. Um, the Oedipus complex, as Freud proposed it, occurs during the, the second stage of what he calls the psychosexual development of children. And, uh, of course, it has some sexual overtones to it, but what it's really getting at is resolving issues of intimacy and authority. So if you take a child, a male or female child, because in the female case, it's called the electric complex, uh, what happens is, is that the same parent, you have to resolve issues of the authority of the same sex parent. But what you establish with the opposite sex parent is intimacy. And so one of the things a child is supposed to learn in the Oedipal stage is how to deal and interact with authority and how to deal and interact with intimacy. So that's the connection of why you want to marry your mom and is, you want to have intimacy like that. Yes. And you want to kill your dad because you're challenging authority. Right. And some significant differences with Freud's Oedipus complex. Oedipus, the character obviously did not willfully make those choices to do that. But Freud, in observing the play, felt like it demonstrated an archetype. And an archetype was a universal behavior. And so he took this archetypal behavior from Oedipus Rex and extrapolates it out into the Oedipus complex. So, so like a metaphor. Yeah, yeah. Psychologically, I guess we can say that. But it's, it's his explanation of... Uh, how male and female behavior emerge and how you learn about intimacy and authority. Uh, and it's going to lead to things like fixation and stuff we won't spend time Does he on suggest, right. in your uh, opinion, that if you don't resolve it, it'll end badly like Oedipus? Yes. In all of Freud's stages, you have challenges that have to be resolved. And if you do not resolve them successfully, you are fixated or stuck on those issues for the rest of your life until you do resolve them in one way or another. So eventually either resolve it or stab your eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's a little dramatic, I think. But in light of the play, I see your point. So Freud is saying that this is a deep, unconscious driving motivational force, whereas in Oedipus Rex, he had no idea that he was doing these things. Freud is saying, yeah, deep in your unconscious, you know you have these things going on and you're shamed by them, which is why you have all these conflicts. And Anyway, it's Freud. He's psychodynamic. He's, uh, he's, he's a pioneer. And so we, we, we pay uh, honor to his earliest yeah. ideas. You know. And like Aristotle and Sophocles, he's just saying what he's seeing. Yes. Well, and... <laughs> He, yes, and that's exactly what he did. He observed a lot of behavior before he came up with these theories. All right. Well, on that note, are we going to call this play a wrap and move on to Antigone? Yes, we shall do that. If we uh, have successfully resolved all the conflicts of Freud and Oedipus Rex and Sophocles and all that, we'll wrap it up. So thanks for being with us. Tell your friends about us uh, that you are listening to the How to Love Lit podcast. And follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and look at us on our How to Love Lit Podcast.com page. We have teaching materials and other fun stuff that you can use. So, next time when we get together, we're going on to the next stage of Antigone. Peace out.